So tonight, the question is, was 2022 the best year ever for mods? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm hoping at the end of it, you'll agree that it certainly was uh, a pretty good year. I just put this title slide together, and it rather exemplifies what the year was about. But um, after I've done this slide, somebody sent me 3,000 records from South Yorkshire, from BC63. They were really good records. And I sent an email back, thanks for these super records, but you've made one obvious typo. Uh, you have gone and put Alan Boney and Jeff Rella there. What was it meant to be? Because, I mean, that hasn't been seen in Yorkshire since 1935. And straight away, I got an email back, and there's Alan Boney and Jeff Rella. So that's been lurking probably in the county for goodness knows how long. And that was found at a small Yorkshire Wildlife Trust reserve called Fen Carr in BC 65. Now, a lot of these small YWT reserves are actually getting a bit of attention now, thanks to people like Alistair Bitter. And there's all sorts that's lurking there. There's all sorts still in the county that we don't really know is there, which is what makes it so exciting. So it was an unusual year, wasn't it? It was an unusual year weather-wise, the hottest year ever, ever. I mean, that's incredible, isn't it, really? And, uh, and Yorkshire had some very hot temperatures. Uh, the record temperature was further south, wasn't it? But we had um, temperatures of over 39. Topcliffe, 39.6. It's always Topcliffe, isn't it, against these records. And these temperatures like this do have an effect on things. They have an effect on invertebrates, in particular moths, which are very sensitive uh, indicators of, of changes in climate. So that really hot day was the 19th of July. Just, just bear that in mind. So what happened? Well, we had a lot of new county records. Uh, 12 county records is the biggest number I've seen since I've been interested in moths, and that's now for about 23 years. We've had a colossal number of vice county records this year. Again, I don't think I quite remember seeing that many before. Looking at new uh, species, new records for a 10 kilometer square, 3,070. Well, I did this slide yesterday. Uh, it's now 3,090, so it just goes up all the time. And that's an awful lot of extra dots on distribution maps, which is good. So I thought the first thing we ought to do is look at all the 12 county records. So that's quite interesting to see what's moved into the county. And the first one of these was Travel Brown Spot, Mick Stoll got said in his trap at uh, Easington at Spurn. And I'm going to be showing quite a few of these maps from the Macro Moth Atlas. And for those who aren't familiar with them, most of you will be, the, the yellow dots are historical ones, often going back into the 19th century. The blue dots are 1970 to 2000, and the black dots are 2000 till, or well, 2016, which is when the, the, the Atlas records finished. And so you can see if a species is sedentary, but it's increasing by comparing the black dots with the blue dots, basically. And for treble brown spots, it's a fairly sedentary thing. It's not moving much. There's a bit of movement at the northern edge, isn't there? Some of these little black dots here are new. There's a dot moved into Lincolnshire there. Uh, and so it's not that surprising that once turned up here at Spurn. This has been one that's been on our radar. I've been wondering if at some stage we will get treble brown spots. Now, will you recognise treble brown spot when you catch it? Well, I, I hope you will. Mick did. And uh, I thought I'd put this slide together that shows three troubled brown spots on the left and three small fan footed waves on the right, because that's something you're going to mistake it for. And there's a form of small fan footed wave, particularly this top one, which does look rather similar, doesn't it? But this brown band here is discontinuous. Uh, so you, you shouldn't really mistake them. The books say that this smudging, this, this costal bar, on travel round spot doesn't occur in small fan footed wave, but I'm not so sure, are you? I mean, there's a, there's a pint of it there, isn't there? So that's travel brown spots. Right, what's the next one? The next one is dotted fan foot. Now, this has been one that's been on our radar for a bit, and you can see from the map that this thing is spreading since 2000. It's spread definitely west, hasn't it, around here? And there's been a record in Lincolnshire. Over the last five years since it's out, it may have come a little bit further north. So I'm not that surprised that Ian Marshall and Andy Knight actually found this at Wellick Salt Marsh. It's, uh, it's a wetland moth. It, it feeds on species of, uh, of uh, wood rush and wood reed. And uh, there are various fan foots or fan feet, I don't know what you say, moving north. Plume fan foot and shaded fan foot are also following it. We might get those in years to come. 
So I don't think that's the last of dotted fan fold that we'll see. But this is probably got lays claim to moth of the year, Salonicchioli. Pete Smith was trapping at it at Winterset, where he traps. And he found this at the bottom of the trap, and he thought, crikey, what on earth is that? It's like, uh, it's like an nicholine on steroids. Beautiful looking thing. And he had a look around and thought about it and came up with the idea it might be salonicholine. And he's right, it is. Now, this thing languishes in Appendix B on the British list. It's that rare. It's in Appendix B based on the fact that there are three dodgy old records in the 19th century. That's a expensive specimen in the Natural History Museum said to be caught in the New Forest. But nobody really believes these. This is the first proper British record. It's now got a proper ABNH number. Uh, fixed in a nice article which should be coming out, I hope, in the next issue of Atropos all about this. Fabulous thing. It's uh, native to, well, Central Europe and Southern Scandinavia. Uh, and this will have been a migrant, of course. But what a fabulous thing to find in your moth trap. The next one. Harry Beaumont got this in his garden near Rotherham, Cypress Pug. Now, Cypress feeders have tend to be doing very well. We had Cypress Carpet invade the county, didn't we, a few years ago. We still got odd records of that. There was a Cypress Carpet up in VC62 this year. But Cypress Pug has definitely been on our radar. And since uh, the Atlas, it has, we know it's come further north. We records in Cheshire and things like that. So uh, it was very much on the card to, uh, to get to Yorkshire. So uh, if your neighbour's complaining about your Lelandia hedge, then to hell with them. Let them complain. Don't rip it out just yet. If you want to catch Cypress Pug and Cypress Carpet first. Now, that's rather a, a worn looking specimen, isn't it? Not the most pristine thing. And people don't like pugs uh, because you, you can't identify them. But, but you can identify Cypress Pug because when it's fresh, it looks like that. It's a wonderful looking thing. It's got this fantastic stonking great bar on the first abdominal segment which is continuous with the lines on its wing lovely looking thing so when you catch that in your trap uh, you're going to know about it we will see more of this this is something we're going to see right on to the micros now then there are very many very good micro maps this is the best i could do for a clearer shepherd armor but as you can see it's a moth of the south and east of england and it's not that's surprising that it's popped from Lincolnshire over to Spurn. The problem really is when identifying the thing. Now, Tony Broom found in his trap at Spurn and, and lest you may realise that it might be something different. Most people would have just passed this over as a clearish rhombana. But he, he smelt a rat and they sent it to me and it is a clearish shepherdana. Uh, this is a, a meadow sweet feeder, so there's plenty of habitat about. So how do you recognise the thing? Well, that's a Spurn moth on the top. Beneath it are two rhombanas, and they're very similar, aren't they? They've both got these uh, curvy subfolcates, the word, a subfolcate wing from folks, is Latin for a sickle, isn't it? Uh, rhombanas meant to have more pointy wings, but I'm not so sure. And they've both got this sort of reticulated appearance, haven't they? Uh, and a bar in rhombanas meant to go further across the wings and things, but very similar. The best way of telling them apart is to look at the cilia, the, the, the hairs at the end of the wing. And in, in uh, Shepardana, they're, they're, they're darkish or concolorous with the actual colour of the wing. In Rombana, they're pale or even yellowy colour, much paler than the wing. The other thing about Shepardana is it uh, flies a little bit earlier. This moth was in July when no self-respecting Rombana is going to be on the wing. So if you catch a Rombana that doesn't look quite right and it's a little bit early in the year, just bear in mind it might be Shepardana because it may well have been lurking in the county uh, unsuspected for a little while. Andy Nunn went in his garden and like me, when he's gardening, he doesn't garden, he looks at leaves. And he found this blackthorn, he's looking for something else. And he found this mine and it's Leonith, Leonithia prunifoliella. This is the cousin of Leonithia clarkella, the thing that uh, forms dirty, thin mines on apple and cherry and all sorts of other things. And this is prunifoliella. Uh, and he was very clever because he managed to breed it out. And that's the pupa, that's his picture. He actually bred out the adults. I think it's a, a, a nicer looking moth than the uh, Leonetia Clark color. It's quite distinctive because it's got these pearly chains of black frost. Nothing else has that. So it's a super thing. 
it hasn't really been in, in the county for, for that long. Well, I say it hasn't, it hasn't. It used to be, uh, it used to be a residence until about 1900, then it disappeared for about 110, 115 years. And then it, uh, it recolonized. And if you try and find a map of it, that's the map from the National Leaf Mining Scheme. It's got three dots on it. Uh, Rob Edmonds hasn't updated his maps for some while because it has gone, uh, there are more dots than that now, but it's not a common thing. But it's obviously spread and it's spread right up here to VC61. And I think it's something we're going to see more of. So if you see some of these things, and this, again, it's got these little chains of frost. It really is quite a distinctive looking thing. Terry Crawford caught this in his trap in home. Can you believe it? Lucky devil. Ethmia bipunct teller. This is the, the bigger cousin of Ethmia quadrilella, the country feeling thing that uh, I get in my area. But this is one and a half times bigger. It will feed on country, but it normally feeds on vipers bugloss. And it's a moth of the south and east of England, as you can see from this map. And it's said that all those further north are migrants. So I doubt this is going to be a resident, but you just never know with, with climatic change. It always got me, why is it called bipunctella? Bipunctella, two spots. It's got more than more spots than two on its wings. Hasn't it? It's got four spots on its thorax. I actually found out the reason for that. And the reason is that if you pin and set it and stick its wings out at the right hand, you can't see these front two spots. And we see these rear two spots. So these are the two spots of bipunctella. That's just a fabulous thing to find, isn't it? A lot of people have been using pheromones, not just for clear wings, which lots of us have been doing for a while, but there are all sorts of different pheromones you can get from uh, Anglian Lepidopterist supplies for tortric species, such as graphalitas and pamanes and kidias. And you put them up and you get all sorts of things in them, not just the target species. And uh, Samantha Batty at Ostersfield in the very southeast of BC 63 has been using these a lot. And there is a specific law for Lobosevskii. And she caught it, and it's the first for counting. Now, the problem with a lot of these things is identifying them. A lot have to be deceptive, but you've got a fighting chance with Lobosevsky. Now, you can mistake it for, particularly for Janthinana. This thing's Graffalita Janthinana. And when it's warm, it looks just like this above. It doesn't always look as pristine as that. And Janthinana turns up in all these traps. It's a really promiscuous thing. If you go to any flipping pheromones, I find it in about five different pheromones. Traps. So that's very similar. This thing is a cherry bark moth. This is Anharmonia formosana, and that looks very similar. This one, the top right, is what Lovisiski is meant to look like. Uh, Samantha's was, was rather warm, and you can see it is rather similar. But the best way of telling them apart is to look at the head, the hairstyle. It's got a, an orangey brown rinse, and it's got an orangey brown shawl. You can still see the remains of that in this one, <coughs> and the confusion species don't have that. So you do have a fighting chance with Lobos SKI. Coleophora lacella. Coleophora has reduced some people to jelly, certainly because there are over 100 species of Coleophora in the country, and they all look the same. We've had 47 different ones recorded in Yorkshire this year. When I did Latin at school, they said, well, it's really important when you have to do medicine, you've got to do Latin. Well, it's a load of rubbish. You don't need medicine for, you don't need Latin for medicine at all, but you do. It is very useful in later life when you start doing natural history. And lacella, it's from the same word as, oh, I'm sorry, I'm from the same word as lassitude, so tired, washed out. It's a tired, washed out looking moth. And Ian Heppenstall caught this in his garden trap in Rossington, and he dissected it because you have to dissect it. Uh, and it was La Sella. And look where La Sella occurs. There's no records anywhere near us. That's a huge jump in range. Uh, that's not the actual moth. That's a picture I nicked off the internet. And there are very few pictures of it. There are very few pictures of the larval cases. Uh, this is a larval case here. And uh, it forms larval cases on toad brush. Toad brush is a little tiny low growing brush of uh, bare moist ground. And so uh, this is one to look for. This is one that here's, here's, here's the challenge for you, Andrew, to try and find this. It's just the sort of thing that you'll find, but it's uh, it's not easy to find. So La Sella, it may have been in the county for, for a little while. We might not have known about it. Scrobia palpara salatella. This is one of the stories of the year. Scrobia palpas are high difficult things. There are a lot of them. They all look very, very similar. Uh, Ocellatella, again, you've got a fighting chance with because uh, Ocellatella, that, that gives you a clue with these little eyes. It's got these little eyes on its wings. It's got a dark patch with a white 
a white area around it. There they are, celli. Uh, now this thing, if you look, if you still look at the UK moths website, and this is a gift from the UK moths website, beet moths, Scrobifar prostellatella, a local species occurring on shingle coasts and salt marshes along the southern coast of England and Wales. Well, that's certainly been the case. You look at that map. Feeds on sea beet. Now, sea beet is the uh, is the wild native equivalent of all our all our uh, domestic beet, like uh, beetroot and sugar beet and Swiss chard and that sort of thing. So it feeds on sea beet. Now, if you look at the Galikid website, this is Steve Palmer's Galikid website, which is a fabulous site if you haven't seen it. It really is. This is the situation towards the end of two thousand and twenty one. And all these coastal records feeding on sea beat, but you've got a few inland records, and these have very recently appeared. So what on earth is going on? Now, in 2022, in about July, people started capturing big numbers of this moth inland. And I mean, I mean big numbers, you know, double figures in a trap, even a hundred, huge numbers of these things inland. And it went north. And it went north, and the first one was in South Yorkshire, and it went further north. And if you look at the Yorkshire records this year, this is a moth known from the south and east of England, and look at it in Yorkshire. It's astonishing. So it's not just feeding on sea beet, it's feeding on uh, domestic beetroot crops. And it went further north, up into Northumberland. I'm not sure if it didn't get as far as Scotland. It went across the Lancashire, it went into Wales. It's gone everywhere. So the big question is, what's going to happen next year to this moth? Is this just a passing wave? Will it disappear again? Or is it mutated and it's formed a liking for domestic beasts that is part of our former forever? It's incredible. And most of them came in this big wave at the very beginning of September, a week where I decided to go on holiday to Scotland. Uh, I missed all this. So I managed to get a couple uh, the week after on the way back. So that is really one of the stories of the year. You couldn't have predicted that one. Another new moth. Calyptilias are tricky things, aren't they? Because they all look the same. And a lot of species you can't tell without deception. There's only four or five calyptilias you, you can actually tell by sight. Now, Honoritella is, is a new one. And it first appeared in the country in 2016 on the south coast. Then it disappeared about it for two years. And since 2019, it's been spreading. And Colin Plant wrote a very nice article in Entomologist Record uh, just a few months ago. And this was this picture out of that article. It shows where it has spread to by December 2021. So this year, uh, Samantha Bata here in, at the Ostafi, we've got two rather interesting looking Honora tellers. Uh, and she sent them to me. The first one wasn't, uh, it was uh, semi fashion but the second one is this particular moth, and it is Honora Teller. And then Ian Marshall looked at uh, a moth that he'd got previously and, and under dissected this, and that was Honora Teller. So it's got to two vice counties in Yorkshire. Now, this thing forms uh, cones on sycamore leaves. And uh, in the same way that Calyptilia rufi panana does. So if you find sap cones from now onwards on sycamore or field maple or Norway maple, you cannot tell what species of Calyptilia it is, uh, which has complicated the matters. And there are other Acephida Calyptilias uh, massing on the shoreline, waiting for uh, boat people to bring them across, and Suella's doing her best to try and stop them coming, but that they're going to come. Uh, and the situation is getting more muddy by the moment. So that's Calactilia honora tella. And uh, there's going to be a very nice article in the next entomologist record, which uh, is all about this particular moth. Ian Marshall got this in his garden trap. Can you believe it? This is such a rare migrant. It's not even in the micro field guide. I said, have you got a, a picture in? He said, oh, it wouldn't come out. It was so active, I didn't like to let it out of the pot. I don't blame him, I wouldn't have let it out of the pot as well, but that's his original picture. And there's no doubt that's what it is. Um, this is it in uh, other moths, uh, the same thing in, in, uh, in better light. Very distinctive creature, very rare migrant. Um, it's only been a migrant in recent years. Uh, there have been, I think, maybe one or two in the country this year, but uh, are quite, Fabulous addition to the Yorkshire list. <clears throat> and it's late, so in 12th of November, a lot of migrants came very late this year. We've had a first since Porritt. So in Porritt's time, small seraphim was uh, 
a resident in the county. It was resident in all sorts of places. It come from everything here, isn't it? And then it disappeared. It hasn't been in the county since the 1880s. And it's a moth of uh, damp woodland, isn't it, of the south and the, and the west, really. There have been some recent dots here, haven't they, which is a bit fishy of further movements. But uh, the, the VC62 boys got it up here in Paxton Bank Wood, right up in VC62. And then they got it again the following week, so it, it is resident. And the, the big question is, of course, is has it been there all along, or has it just moved in? I, I just wonder if it's been there all along undetected. Now, intriguingly, there was uh, an unconfirmed record this year from Spurn, but no photo. So certainly want to keep your eye open. Reasonably distinctive. And a second county record, Jersey Tiger. Now that was a bit of a turn up, wasn't it? We did have one, that's his most northerly dot on the, on the distribution map here. That was at uh, Moortown, Leeds, 2008. And we put that down to an escape or somebody had bred it. I think that's probably the case. But uh, it's really spread recently. It used to be confined to South Devon down here. And then over the last 20, 30 years, it's, it's really run riot. Uh, and it's spread, it's spread to London area. And since this, uh, Atlas was published, it's gone further north. So it's not surprising that we've had one in Sheffield. It's been photographed, and there it is. That's the photograph. The situation is slightly muddled. <clears throat> I hope to show this picture. Uh, the big butterfly count is, is, is a great idea. It, 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 it's a good thing. And I'm all for it. Spend 15 minutes in a sunny spot with your little chart, and any type of butterfly that you see is going to be on this chart, which is which fabulous. And you send your records in, and they're all repatriated to butterfly recorders, and they're, they're nice, wonderful. But for some unknown reason, which I can't fathom, butterfly conservation have put three moths down there out of two and a half thousand to choose from. And I kid you not, what people do, they stand in the garden recording butterflies. If they see a little brown noctua, oh, it's a silver white tick. If they see a bird at moth of any sort, there's not any spots it's got to be a tick. And if they see anything that's brightly coloured, like cinnabar or garden tiger, they go tick there. And so these must, these, all these records get sent and they get repatriated, that's the word, repatriated to county recorders. And two years ago, we had 15 Jersey tigers in the county, apparently. So I assiduously write to all these people and try and get them to reply and they never do. And the ones that do, it's cinnabar or it's uh, wood tiger, wood tiger, that's not. So uh, this year, uh, butterfly conservation, I've fallen out of it. They're, they're no longer sending me records because I just think they've been there. Uh, so when uh, when they tell you that Jersey Tiger has increased by 377%, I think it's only butterfly, something like that. Well, it, it has increased, but whether it's quite increased 377%, I don't know, because I'm not sure that all county recorders have got such jaundiced, cynical views and I've got, but, uh, but never mind. Anyway, that's just me. So vice county records. Well, if we went through every vice county record, we'll be here till midnight and you all get very bored, so we won't do that. So we'll, we'll look at other things. It's been an incredible migration season. It really has. The things that turn up and make your hair curl. Striped hawk moth is a very rare migrant in Yorkshire. Um, on these maps, these, these grey dots are historical sort of horrid type dots. So the red dots are 2022. I thought we had more than five striped hawk moths in the county. What happens is they get on social media, and I try and please social media, but sometimes I fail. And these things, of course, were seen by non-mothers who have no business to catch striped hawk moths. They should be left to, uh, to proper mothers like us. So there may be more than five, but people further south of us are catching loads of these things, three in a trap and things, weren't they? So, and they were fairly early. It was May, June, July, wasn't it? And then they all disappeared, which is what... Uh, the species tends to do. There are lots of other hawk moths about, weren't there? there? are a lot of convolvious hawk moths, quite a few bed straw. Uh, the old death's head and death's head larvae were found and things. It was a really good year for, for all hawk moths. Bordered straw. We have bordered straw years, don't we? 2006, which was uh, uh, the best migrant season you're going to ever see. We, 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 we had 90. Uh, we had 60 odd in 2015. We've had a third bordered straw year here. So we've had nearly 40 and they turned up all over the place. And uh, normally people sending in bored of straw records, you query and they're all typos for barred straw, but, but, but not this year. And they came sort of broad front from May to September. 
can have this board straw. We've got a lot of scarce board of straw as well. I mean, never like this sort of once in a lifetime season of 2006, where we got 270 of the very things. But they turned up all over the county, more along the coast than, than inland. But uh, I got one here, I was quite pleased. And they came in this late migrant surge, the very last week in October, all sorts of things turned up then. Um, so that's scarce bordered straw. Lots of steaky, stick to kale. It's, uh, if we get one record a year or two, you, you've done really well. We had 50 or 60 this year. Absolutely incredible. It turned up everywhere. A lot of people came across this for the very first time. And it came in this, this migrant service, uh, the first week of September, where I went to Scotland and missed it all. So I didn't see lots of steaky, stick to kale. So uh, that was hugely more than we ever had before. And I think it got to counties further north than us as well. Golden twin spot. Golden twin spot, the, the, the twin spots are often fused like this, which is, uh, so these often looks that, that separated like this. So um, this is in October, isn't it? So in the October migrant surge, and, and Chris Frost gets one at, uh, at uh, Wittensee. Uh, and she puts it on the auction on Facebook group. This is Golden Twin Spot. We say, yeah, well done, Chris. That's fantastic. That's a really good record. It's, it's not a common migrant in the auction. It's only a turn up over the years. It's, not, uh, it's only just into double figures. And then the following week, John Lee puts one on the Facebook group. He says, oh, it's Golden Twin Spot. So I identify as 100%. And we say, yeah, fine. And I just smelt a rat. It just didn't look quite right to me. This corner of the wing doesn't look right. Can you send it to me? So we did, and I dissected it, and it was Tunbridge Wells gem. Can you believe it? There's one record in Nairsborough, that's this stop here, in 1955. And that he's going to call this near Wakefield. Fabulous record. And in retrospect, there were one or two in counties further to our south. But that was a most unexpected thing. Some moths, you never quite know if they're migrants or not. We're going to have to redefine our definition of migrants, sort of from the, the Suella Braverman side of it, so sort of, well, some of these migrants are like Cockneys relocating to, to, to Leeds, aren't they? Or like, like Rishi leaving the House of Commons and going to his constituency in Richmond, aren't they? But, and I think Clifton Nompre is a bit like this. You can see from the map that all these yellow dots, it used to be a resident species everywhere, didn't it? Then it, it completely disappeared. And uh, it came back to England in 2007. And it came back to southern counties. This we're doing very well there, and it's and it spread a bit. But all these northern ones, I mean, they're all, all migrants, aren't they? They must be. We've had the odd one uh, since two thousand. Well, we had one near Ripon. I didn't catch it. Obviously, I haven't done the odd. It turns up at Spurn now again. Uh, and we get one or two a year if we're really lucky. And the year before last, we got three. We thought that was fantastic. But this year, look at this. And look at this graph. 14 records of Clifton Nonpareil. I suspect there were more, because again, this is one of these things that non-mothers find and put on social media and don't tell me about. And they've no business to catch their really thing. They should have let me catch it. And I haven't seen one yet. And it's not fair. But anyway, they all came in August and September. Are these migrants? I think they probably are. But it's just a little bit fishy, isn't it? I mean, Samantha Batty here gets three. So you get three, you didn't get any strike moths, but whole moths, but you've got three Clifton non -parades. It just makes you think that it's breeding not that far from us now. And I think this is something we're going to see quite a lot more of. I'm looking forward to seeing the first one. This isn't the only one that's a sort of dubious migrant. What about White Point? All the books will tell you that it's resident in the southeast and everywhere else it's a migrant. And well, okay, some of these appear maybe migrants, but it's been resident in the east of Yorkshire for Oh, quite a while, a good 10 years, I'm quite sure. And the way these dots are expanding, this is a way, this is a, a wave of advance, isn't it? You see, with so many things. So whether these really are migrants or not is a, is a very open-ended question. Now then, at the end of last year, this was the situation. It's resident here, there's no doubt. Uh, Osterfield had it. I had it in the garden truck last year. And I remember saying, well, where does this come from? Is it local spread from this lot? Is it a migrant from, uh, you know, Rishi moving south, moving north? Or what is it? Where does it come from? What's going to happen in 2022? Well, I'll show you what happened in 2022. That happened. It turned up absolutely everywhere. Absolutely incredible. And a lot of them in this big migrant surge at the end of October. Are these migrants? Is it local spread? 
I think it's local spread. I don't think these moths have come from very far. I certainly don't think they've come from the continent. What's going to happen next year? Are they here to stay? Will they retreat again? You know, I, I, the, the more you do this, the more questions you ask yourself. And this isn't the only one in this category. Right on this one, this is four spotted footmen. Not four dotted footmen, not the, the pretty little thing you get on a lowland heath like Strensel. This is four spotted footmen. Females got the spots. This is a, this is a footman on, on steroids. It's a big footman, not a lichen feeder. And again, the books all say, well, it's resident in the southwest. Everywhere else, it's a migrant. Well, is it? So, OK, these in Yorkshire, these are migrants. So I'm not suggesting it breeds up here, but you've got this cluster of records here, which is a bit funny, isn't it? And it used to be a lot more... Uh, prevalent, didn't it? Looking at those yellow dots. So what's happened in 2023? Well, uh, we've had a migrant one. Nick Carter got it in the garden at Hunnambi Gap, the lucky devil. He was over the moon. I'm not surprised. Fabulous thing to get. But then Bill Honeywell gets one in West Bradford there, virtually in Lancashire. And then John Perry gets one in Ingleton. And then he gets another one. And then he gets another one. They're going to catch one one migrant is, is it okay? That's good, isn't it? But but three is just smacking of showing off, really, isn't it? So there's something going on. So I was talking to Steve Palmer, uh, having been in, in Lancashire. He says there've been nearly sixty in Lancashire. So this is breeding in Lancashire and spilling across into our borders. I don't think there's any doubt about this. And so the fact that all these northern records of migrants, I think, is just plain wrong. A lot of moths have been increasing the range this year. And the one that's been increasing its, increasing its range, really more than anything, is barred hooktip. Barred hooktip is a fairly recent uh, invader to the county. It's been here since 1991. And you look at the atlas, a lot of these black dots, it's, it's moved north, hasn't it? And uh, the numbers have been slowly increasing, haven't they? But, you know, you get 10, 12 records a year, you've done a good year. This year, nearly 60 records. So that's the situation to the edge of, end of 2021. You put the 2022 dots in, and that's what's happened. It's rocketed everywhere. All these dots in places, particularly in the north of the county, where it hasn't been seen. It's moved up to Durham. It's moved up to Northumberland. It's moved north of Newcastle. It's moved up to, well, Drewridge Bay area. You know how far north that is. This has moved, it's not one of these things moving forward at four or five kilometres a year. It's moving at 40, 50 kilometres a year. Absolutely incredible. It's a double brooded thing, isn't it? Looking at the screenogram. It's a start of the second brood that they all come out of the pupa and they've looked at the travel brochures and they thought, well, where are we going to go? And off they've gone. Incredible. So many people sent me photos of barred hook tips saying, I've never seen this before. Do you think it's barred hook tip? Yeah, of course it is. Now then, these little ermine moths, crikey, they bring terror to people, don't they? Because they all look the same. Ermine. Right. Bird cherry ermine is a piece of cake. It's got more dots than all the others. It's got more rows of dots, and it's got about a dozen dots in each row. And everybody's happy with, with uh, bird cherry ermine. And that's apple ermine, or is it spindle ermine? And that's spindle ermine, or, or is it apple ermine? And that's orchard ermine. And you, you can't tell them apart. You can't even dissect them to tell them apart. The field guard says you can't, but you can't. Believe me, you can't tell them apart. There's, a, there's one you can record because orchard ermine, and this one right up, this actually is orchard ermine. Um, it's got a dark, dusky form, hasn't it? And it's uh, the amount of duskiness varies a bit. But if it's dusky all over its wings, I'll let you record that as orchard ermine, that's okay. Then we've got willow ermine, and to my eyes, willow ermine looks different. And willow ermine doesn't differ. It always looks the same. It's got this dusky streak along here. And the important thing is it's got this pale strip along the costa here, at the leading edge of the wing. And this pale strip enlarges uh, to form a bit bigger that. And, and, and it always looks like this. And if you get those in your trap, you, you know it's something different. And it's a new thing in the county. 2001 was the first one. The, the books all say it's an immigrant, an occasional residence, and it's an immigrant. But our first ones were of things like um, larval webs on willows at York University. There, just I used to find it there. And then people started getting it in the trap. And I started getting it in the trap in about 2016 17, you get one or two. And if anybody got double figures in the trap, that was really quite incredible. I and mean, we put these down to waves of migrants. 
Then, do you remember the hottest day was the 19th of July, wasn't it? Well, the morning of the 19th, I went to look at my moth trap, and it was festooned with these things. They were all over the place. I counted 108. There were probably a lot more. And then the record started coming in, and Penny Roth said she got 130 in a trap the following day. And then somebody got 99 in the trap in Keithley. And then not long ago, John Cooper, who lives down here on the 63, 64 border, he sent, he got 400 and something in his trap on the on night of the 18th. What's going on? It's absolutely incredible. And when you consider that this is a moth that most people don't recognise and can't identify, you look at the distribution map for this year, and that is a difficult to identify moth. It must have been everywhere in big numbers. Now, the intriguing thing is one or two people who I know can identify it got it in very small numbers. So why was this incredible wave uh, at the beginning of or middle of July localised? And it was localised. And I don't understand this. Uh, there's, I do not, I can't get my head around the willow worm in at all. And this wave just gradually died away. Uh, and it died away to next to nothing. And there it is, it's gone. So what's going to happen next year? Well, your guess is as good as mine, it really is. Now, I think this is one of the stories of the year. This is fabulous. Chalk carpet is a really rare moth. Um, butterfly conservation gets up. Uh, get quite excited about it and they uh, draw plans for it and you know, fact sheets on how to conserve chalk carpet because it's, it's declined hasn't it you're looking at that map and that is a map of a declining moth and the populations are becoming fragmented aren't they and in Yorkshire it used to reoccur at various places you would think this is Warham Quarry which hasn't been seen here since the 1990s but we get it uh, we get it at Flamborough and there are good populations at Flamborough. We're very proud of our Flamborough population. We don't get it anywhere else. Now then, 2022, there were good numbers at Flamborough. Uh, Andrew Walpole gets a lot of security lines. Andrew Rodder went trapped at Flamborough. We got 11. You know, nobody ever catches 11 chalk carpets. That's amazing. Now, the following week, he went to Ford and Chalk Bank and he got one there. Now, I'm not suggesting he took it with him. I did it fly from Flamborough? Uh, is it a colony at Forden that we didn't know about? I think that's really exciting. But even more exciting was this one here. Because Catherine Jones got this in her garden. She trapped at the very northwest corner of Richmond. And she got one there. Now, this is a sedentary moth. It doesn't fly 50, 60 kilometres. And the interesting thing is in Porrick's list, in 1883, the Reverend Morris said it occurred in Richmond. Now, how's this moth been lurking there since 1883 for 140 years with nobody knowing it was there? I think there's quite a good chance that it actually was. Now, <coughs> pardon me, I'm going to go up there with Catherine next year. We're going to settle our traps. We're going to catch this thing. We're going to find out what it's all about. The other interesting thing with chalk carpet is if you look at this phenogram, we got a double brood in October. Nobody gets a double brood of chalk carpet. They don't get a double brood in the south of England of chalk carpet. And all these records, of course, go to butterfly conservation at the end of the year, and Les Hill send them back and says, what are you sending me October records of chalk carpet for? I said, well, it's occurs in October. I send him pictures, and he, he finally agrees now. But this is really weird, and that our Flamborough population is double brooded. Right, chocolate tip. Chocolate tip's been in the county since 2009, has it? It's been uh, very slow in the early stages, and then it's got a bit uh, gathered pace, but we've had 88 records this year for chocolate tip. Now, a lot of species are increasing, and some increase the range at the same time, and some don't. So what's happened with chocolate tip? This is a situation at the end of 2021. It's, uh, it's spread nicely. This is a situation at the end of 2022, and it is moving. Uh, a lot of these dots are at the end of, edge of the range, lots of new areas being colonised. It's moving forward five kilometres a year or something like that, isn't it? And it? There's no reason why it shouldn't carry on doing that. There's plenty of habitat for it. I live here. When am I going to get it? Three, four years? Who knows? It may be sooner. I'm rather hoping it's going to be sooner. So that's doing jolly well. Older kitten. Now, this, this is a funny moth, this older kitten. Look at the distribution of older kitten. It's, it's all the books, so it's a moth of south and west, isn't it? But you've got this population south of London here, and you've got a population in East Anglia. It's a fairly sedentary thing in the south. It's not moving, is it? In the north, 
it, it just might be moving, mightn't it? It's, it's heading into Yorkshire here. And there were a lot of post-2000 records just into Yorkshire. Of course, it used to occur in Yorkshire, in Boris time, all these yellow dots here. But in 2022, it's, it's moved a bit further. We've had more records of older kitten this year than we have ever had. And uh, Winterson here, Durkars, Wakefield. But Osterfield, it's moved 20 kilometres further east. That's highly significant because it doesn't occur in our neighbouring counties, as far as I know. So that's something to keep your eye on if you're in the south of the county. Vines rustic, the reason I show this isn't just because it's spread, but it is spreading because all these new dots in BC62, lots of dots in the west of the county, it continues to increase every year. But the interesting thing is, is when it's appearing, because the latest record of Vines Rustic we have on our database, we had on our database, was the 21st of October. We have had 23 records later than that this year, up to the 11th of November, and it's producing a third brood. This is an undoubted third brood here. The books tell you it's double brooded and doesn't produce a third brood. European literature suggests that in some parts of Europe it can be triple brooded, and I'm quite certain that it is here. Uh, is it here to stay to do that? Who knows? It's certainly increasing. And Short Cloaked has done the same. It's produced a second brood. Look at that. We've got a lot of really late records of Short Cloaked. And the field guide says in the hot, dry summer of 2006, a small second generation appeared in southern England. Well, we can add to that, can't we? In the hot, dry summer of 2022, a small second generation appeared in northern England. And uh, that isn't the only moth that's had a lot of late records. We've had, I haven't added it up yet, but I think we've had a record number of species appearing both early and late this year, because we had a very early spring. And some ridiculous, ridiculous early records. Coronet. Look at what's happening to Coronet. We've had over 300 coronet records this year. Now, this is a moth, you, you, you may remember, this is a slide from last year. This is an old slide. Um, you may remember that there's a native population of coronets in the Dales here. And it's an old ash woodland in the Dales. Fair enough, it's been there since Adam was alive. Now, the population in Lincolnshire built up in 2010, the first moth appeared at sperm. And every year it has advanced forward. It's advanced forward in measured tread every year, methodically and steadily. And at the end of 2000, and 20 is that blue line. That is a line in regards to 2020. The end of 2021 is the orange line. It's gone forward 10 kilometres. That's a lot for a month in a year. And the big question I was asking last year was, when are these populations going to meet <coughs> and what's going to happen? So what's happened in 2022? Now, that's what's happened. I'll just go back to that. So that has changed into that. I haven't put a line on, and there's a reason. These are our new dots along a new front, perhaps. But the thing that I don't understand, Jill Warwick got one in a garden trap in Sherlock. It hasn't been seen in the Ripon area for 20 years. Uh, Norman Alvin got one in Thackley, Edo. Hasn't been seen in this area since, well, for 15 years. The native population, I think, has died back. I think this is a new line of advance. I think it's exceeding, it's advancing incredibly rapidly. Can't prove it, but I think these two populations are going to meet. And, and what will happen when they meet? Because populations have been reproductive and isolated, like possibly for centuries. Are they genetically quite distinct now? What's going to happen when they breed? Will they breed? Will it produce a new range of, of super colonets? Or will it be bad news? Uh, is Ash Dieback going to get the whole lot of them? And the story for coronets is, is, is only half run, isn't it? It's going to be fascinating to see what's going to happen. Maiden's Blush. Maiden's Blush has been in the county for, for, forever. Certainly, I knew all about it. And, uh, but it's never been common. We get one or two records a year until well, I mean, about 10, 15 years ago, it started, uh, we started getting more, and it goes up and up and up. But every year, I'm confident to say, well, it's parasitoids are going to get hold of it, and the numbers are going to plummet, and it just shows how much I know about moths, because every year I'm wrong. And the numbers keep going up. 138 records this year. 
quite ridiculous. But the big question is, has it increased its range like chocolate said, Carson? You look at it, and that's the range at the end of 2021, and that's the range at the end of 2022, and there's, there's not a lot of change, is there? Uh, this is a new dot here, isn't it? That's a new dot, but nothing much in the way of new dots. And it's a moth of oak woodland, and there's plenty of habitat up here in BC62. There's habitat up past me here, there's, there's habitat down here. Why isn't it moving? If it was going to move, it would have moved this year, wouldn't it? So I don't understand that. There's, there's a lot I don't understand about moss. Small ranunculus is another one, isn't it? First they got the count in 2010, and they're just sort of jumps big distances. And this year, 80 records. But where's it moved to this time? Uh, that's the situation at the end of 2021. We'd had two years where it appeared at, uh, at Teesside. It jumped up there. This year, it hasn't moved, has it? We have a new dot here, just at the BC62. And there's lots of suitable habitat because it feeds on uh, wild species of lettuce, like Tuca seriola, and uh, you know, great lettuce and prickly lettuce. That, that's quite a bit up, uh, up where I am here. But it hasn't moved. Is it going to move? I don't know. Tree like in beauty. I mean, that, that hasn't been in the county for long, just since 2018, it first appeared at Spurn. And that's had a fabulous year, more records than ever, and a sign of spread of that. Uh, but there are other recent colonists like Toad Flux Brigade, which I thought was going the same way. We've just had one record in the south of the county. So that's done really badly. Black Arches. I mean, Black Arches uh, recolonised the county. And it's, it's been fairly regular since about 2014. And uh, it, it, it sort of pops up here and there. But this year we've had 15 records, which is a, which is a, a lot from Black Arches. And it's turned up particularly in the north of the county. I've come across it a couple of times. Uh, oh, just one thing with this, if you're buying uh, pheromones from Amazon, you can get a pheromone for gypsy moth. And the gypsy moth pheromone attracts, apparently attracts black arches. So I'm going to get some and, and, and see what happens. A couple of micros, Phyloknistis saligna. Uh, I know some people don't like leaf mines, but this is an easy one because it forms these snail trap mines on the willow leaves, uh, long leaf willow leaves, so crack willow in particular, but uh, also white willow, I've seen some weeping willow, very distinctive thing. The larva forms these mines, then it goes back into the stem, it goes along the stem and it goes up into another leaf. So uh, you can find this in winter by looking at the stems. And uh, it was first found by, uh, by Stephen Sounder, the south of BC 63. I mean, not that long ago, 2019, I think. And look what's happened. It's really spreading rapidly. And I've had it in my garden trap. I mean, that, that picture was of an adult in my garden trap. And uh, wherever I look for it, 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 it turns up. Uh, I think it's, a, it's quite under-recorded. I suspect the range is quite a bit bigger than this. So go and have a look for it. You can't mistake it really for anything else. There's a rarer species further south, which is a bit similar to M. Hadia. But uh, if you see those snail track ulcers like that, snail track mines, you, 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 you know it's what it is. Uh, it's an offer horridella. Horridella doesn't mean horrid, it means shaggy. And uh, this has been in the county since 2000 and, uh, what, 2011, I think. And uh, look how that's spreading north, all those new dots. That's, that's rocketing further north. That's not just a two or three kilometres a year job, is it? That's a 10 or 15 kilometres a year job. And the dreaded box tree moth, which has been in the county since 2014. 115 records this year. If you've got a box hedge and it hasn't got you, yes, then you're lucky because it's going to. And it's uh, it's gone further than us now. It's gone further north. Not everything is done well, has it? Some things have done badly. And I, I looked at the list of things that have done badly. And a lot of them are sort of heathland, moorland, and heather feeding things. And I think this is an effect of a parched, dry summer and the hot weather, isn't it? I think the, the larvae haven't really liked that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to these species next year and whether this is continued. Uh, we're coming towards the end now. So some, some other highlights. And there have been so many highlights, it's difficult to know what to put in. But this was a record from two years ago. It took two years to get to me. I've just got it. Uh, this is Durkar near, uh, near Wakefield. Gypsy moth, can you believe it? There was one record, I mean, we presume these are migrants, one record in 1994 in BC 62, but this has turned up in Wakefield. And that's another reason for getting a gypsy moth. Incredible. 
Brown scallop. Brown scallop turned up in BC 62. That's one away from main populations. Uh, it's a buckthorn feeding thing. You've got records down the central belt of Yorkshire, the Mandesium limestone belt. This is quite a long way away. That's a cracking record. Scarlet tiger. We've heard about Jersey tiger. Scarlet tiger uh, has been in the county now for about three years or so. Uh, we've had more records in VC62 this year. We've had one in the west of VC63. That's, that's quite a jump. So uh, this is the thing you're going to find flying by day. I'm, I'm guessing the moth trap and it is spreading. Dewey's Plusia. Again, all the books say they're all migrants, aren't they? Dewey's Plusia, and it's resident in the south. But Samantha Batty, who, who really likes her pheromone, she's had pheromones up at Osterfield, and she's had a knee moth pheromone up, knee moth, nigh moth. Uh, I find that in my garden, all that attracted silver wire, silver wire rather likes it, but Dewey's Plusia likes it. And she's had all those records, virtually all, at pheromones. Now, if you keep catch that number of Dewey's Plusia, they are not migrants, they are residents. So this is residents in the south of the county, and it's a lovely looking thing, and I'm just waiting for other people to catch this. Uh, perhaps if more of them use pheromones, they might, because uh, you're more likely to find it at pheromone than in light traps. Large Thorn, Northern Outpost, is at Spurn, isn't it? Well, so we thought. Uh, it's at Easington in Spurn, isn't it? But it doesn't occur on peninsula Spurn because there aren't any trees. All the forms are tree feeders, aren't they? But uh, Andy Nunn got this at Skippy. So that's a fabulous record. The first one really away from, uh, away from Spurn. Garden Darts. Catherine Jones has had a good year, hasn't she? She's done so many records, but the ones that she sends me have to crackers. Now, we keep thinking Garden Darts extinct in the county, but it, it certainly exists at Richmond. I, I dissected this thing. The last one I saw was in the day. Was it, it, it just pop up occasionally in PC61 on the coast and things. So, so uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> people report Garden Darts at times, and it, it, it rarely is, but, but this one certainly was. Rosie Footman is, is recolonising, isn't it? So we've had occasional records, two records at Spurn this year, which is rather good. Manchester Treble Bar, and virtually all our records, from the very west of BC 64, aren't they? Right on the, uh, the Lancashire Yorkshire border. If you walk along the border, you, you, you see it there on the watershed. But there is a record recently on the Durham side of the Tees in Upper Teesdale. And Peter Murphy got one in his trap at Coliston in Upper Teesdale, look at that one. It really was. I've seen the pictures. So that's a fabulous thing. So it exists up there as well. And of course, there was once a record in, in Lower Teesdale in the Middlesbrough area. I caught Fletcher's pub two years ago at Hackfall, the first record for the county. There weren't any in 2021, but I've trapped in Hackfall a couple of times this year. And in May and June, it was the commonest pug in the trap. I kid you not, 17 in a couple of traps. Uh, and it's a reasonably distinctive, distinctive thing when you see it. It's a moth of old lime woodland. And that fall isn't the only lime woodland in the county. So this thing occurs elsewhere. Have a look what it looks like. It's distinctive. Trap is some lime woodland uh, in, in late May, early June. And you may well find this thing. Speckled yellow, this is Catherine again, isn't it? Uh, speckled yellow flies in May and into June. It doesn't fly in September. This is one of the latest records ever in the country. The, the, there's the odd September record in the very south of England. This is a weird record. Uh, again, I've seen the picture, it's a real thing. What's it doing flying in September? Devon Carpet has, has had a, a really good year. It's turned up at a lot of new sites. A lot of sites in my area, any damp woodland in my area is not producing different carpets. And it's got to Brockadale, it's rare in GC63 still, and Brockadale's a sort of woodland where it might occur. It's, it's damp woodland with heath bed straw. So uh, the only thing you can mistake it for really is this water carpet or small phoenix, but get your eye on it, it looks quite different. Beautiful snout's gone ballistic this year, particularly, particularly in the west of BC 63, extending into the west of BC 64, and, and in the northeast bit of BC 62, it's really become quite common. And that's, we get it to the end, aren't we? So lastly, just to point out that the Yorkshire Moss website has been updated, if you didn't already know. 
Uh, if you look at this figure here, 220,910 records from 783 recorders this year. That's a lot of recorders, isn't it? Uh, and since I gave these to Jim Wheeler to be uploaded, I had rather a lot more records then, actually. It seems to have prompted people to send in records. We're up to about 235,000 already. So it's, it's, it's a record number of records. And, you know, we're not far off the quarter of a million point. So I think I've talked enough. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, I'm very happy to uh, answer them. If I click on stop share, and that might happen, will it? Yes. Charlie, thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating talk. And uh, I can imagine, as you said, you could have taken several hours to cover what you had because <laughs> there were so many things to talk about this year. So thank you very much for praising what... Uh, what, uh, what you've observed in collating, and thank you for collating all the records that everybody sent in. As you said, several hundred people's records that you've had to deal with, which is great. Quarter of a million puts the butterfly ones to, uh, I think we're at about 78,000 butterfly records this year. So, Right, let's move on to questions, if you're okay with that. So yep. um, comment from Martin Gray that he gets small seraphim on an annual basis in his garden near Lincoln. Um, that's interesting. That is that is interesting. It's obviously it's moving north if he's doing that well in Lincolnshire. Yeah. And so that spurn record might be a genuine one. Uh, Andrew Warlow said, is it uh, the fact that you're the result of more people recording moths in recent years? The fact that you've some of them may always have been there, but we've just got more recorders on the ground. I think that's partially the case, yes. And there are some parts of the, of the county which are really underexplored. I mean, the western half of VC65 could hold anything. There could be all sorts lurking there. So, yeah, the more recorders we get, the, the more things turn up. It is true. Julie Mason's commented that she's had maiden's blush and small ranunculus for the first time in Stockton on Tees, just over the border. That's interesting, isn't it? Especially Stockton on Tees. Uh, yeah, we, it, it is resident now on, on Tees side. So that's interesting. Lots of habitat on Tees side. And Maiden's Blush really has, has moved north as well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. One from Dave Wainwright. Charlie, you've mentioned a few species which have start, recently started producing a second brood. Do you have an overall impression based on species that started doing the same longer ago as to whether this is advantageous or not? I, does the abundance tend to increase or decrease over longer term or no consistent pattern? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. That we don't know the answer to that. It isn't always advantageous. Um, and uh, if <laughs> if you're enticing species to have a, a third brood, it, it's, it's not always the right thing for them. Yeah, I don't know. T time will tell is the answer. Yeah. Terry's put in a long, Terry Crawford's put a long comment. I don't know whether you can see it if you scroll through the chat. <laughs> um, Maybe you want to read it rather than me read it out. Uh, I can't find it. Oh, hang on, where have we got? I can't, I can't find the chat. So I've, I've Chat done. chat's next to the share screen at the bottom. Oh, oh, no, I'm clicking on it. Oh, there we are. Right, Seth, perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. What what is best? I, I don't know what it is. I know you can argue both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I don't know if this is a good thing or not. It's it, 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 it's true. Um, a number of individual moths you had, Terry, was down. That's interesting. It was the best year for number of species in my garden by quite a long way. I, I, I got through the 600 value, which I've never done before. And the actual number was up. Um, at, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, 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 for example, a large yellow one doing the, the number crashed with me. I had far fewer. So uh, these things are different in different parts of the county. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So a question from Simon Fincham, which I guess all of us would like some help on this one. Are there any macro moth identifier apps? Uh, yes, they, 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 they're very popular app at the moment. It's a thing called OBS Identify. Uh, and a lot of people take what it says for gospel because it can be remarkably accurate. It can be remarkably bad as well. I mean, I don't know if my wife can hear me from next door, but I tried this on her and it said 75% certainly higher than cow, which, uh, <laughs> which, she, which she didn't like. If it says 100%, then there's a good chance that's what it is. But as, as you've seen from that, uh, that Tunbridge Wells gem, that was 100% certainly golden twin spot. But it's good for pointing you in the right direction. I mean, the other thing's good for pointing you in the right direction. On the, on the, uh, on, on the website, the What's Flying Tonight page, Mm. Uh, all the things you're going to catch will be at the top. 
And there's a there's a, an, an app you can download for your, to your phone. Uh, what's flying tonight? Which is, which is really good. You download it from the website. And again, that's a super thing, which looks at uh, your your 10k square and the 10k squares next to you. It tells you what's likely to be flying at the moment. So they're they're, they're good. There are other. Uh, Macromoth, there are other identifying apps. Of the ones I've looked at, OBS Identify is the best, but please, it is it is not perfect and it does make mistakes. Andy Nunn, comment, great talk, Charlie. Have you any predictions for species that are likely to arrive in the next few years? Who would you <laughs> like to see? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, you're preempting what I'm going to say in the annual report because I'm going to say that. So I'm not going to answer that question. But uh, there, there are various things. And one thing I have not mentioned is that the next two fan books coming, fan feet, uh, dotted and plumed, they, they might come. There, there are various other ones, a lot of micro that are going away as well. So, uh, yeah. A uh, question from Alistair Fitter. To follow up on Terry's point, we've recently compared increasing and declining species in Yorkshire and find that the declining ones are rarer than the increasing ones. In other words, our fauna is becoming more dominated by common species. Is that a general decline? I, I think that's true. Yes, and I've, I've been uh, yes, I'm aware of all this all this work. Um, it, it, it is generally true, but, but then again, there are things bucking the trend. And we'd have said that chalk carpet was decreasing and it's a rarer moth, whatever. That would fit into that category. But yet we've seen something to chalk carpet in Yorkshire this year. So it, it's a very mixed picture. It's all it's all very complicated. Um, this might be interesting. Alan said the chalk carpets that he saw came to LED lights rather than uh, mercury vapour lamps. So yes, that's interesting, isn't change, it? Mm. The change in lamp has actually brought in mm. different sightings. Yeah, yeah. Alan runs a, 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 a quite a good LED light. So there's, there's some awful LED lights around. Alan's a sort of super one. So uh, I think we all need what he's got, really. So. Question from Julie Mason. Do you think the increase in tree planting will help tree loving moths spread across the country? It will, if as long as trees are planted in the right place. I mean, I think <laughs> like, uh, as long as you plant the right trees as, as, as well, that's again, it's a big subject, isn't it? Like in a lot of Dale's planting schemes now, they're, they're planting, uh, they're planting things like uh, like purging buckthorn to attract tissue, and that's really working. Tissues are going up. So, so, so yes, planting the right tree, the right type of tree in the right place, it, 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 it does help, yes. Good. Well, we've exhausted the questions. Anybody got to ask any more questions before we uh, we look to wrap up? Any more questions for Charlie on the chat button? Nothing, Charlie, I think. Yes, it's nice. That's nice. Thank you. I've nearly lost my voice. So can I say a big thank you again, Charlie, for pulling all that together, because that's not... That's not a small presentation to put together with all the data that you've had had to hand. So thank you ever so much for doing that and for presenting it. So, uh, and uh, just like to thank everybody who's joined us tonight to listen to Charlie and also to remind you that there are two more talks on the 6th of February and the 6th of March on Monday night, starting at 7.30, book on Eventbrite. You'll find details on the website and on our social media channels. So, uh, and uh, for all of that, I will uh, stop the recording now and uh,